we need to talk about solar. No, we're not breaking up. Right now, there's a big push in the U.S. and the world to make solar one of the major sources of our electricity. The question is, is that where we should be spending our efforts? Is that the best form of electricity generation with the least amount of greenhouse gases? Hi, I'm Gerald Gijos with almost four decades in the energy field. I'm here to help you sift through some of the information about energy and climate change that we see on social media and in the news so we can make better informed choices about how we move forward in the world today. Welcome to Climate Honesty, where we simplify complex topics to help you be better informed on energy and climate. I've made a couple other videos about solar cells and solar panels and what it takes to make a solar cell, all the way from quartz to the panel itself. In this video, what we're going to focus on is analyzing the solar panel in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions and relate that to other forms of electricity like nuclear or gas. So nerd alert, we're going to have to look at some charts and some graphs in order to do the life cycle analysis justice. Now, the reason I did this is because we can't really see all the inputs that go without looking at it in a graphical form. It'll really show you sort of how the inputs go into a life cycle analysis. Now, a life cycle analysis is simply a way of looking at an entire process and seeing what it takes. It includes everything. In other words, if we have to mine the quartz, we include the energy that it takes to mine it. If we have to recycle it at the end, either we throw it away and we have the energy for that, or we put it back into the process and reprocess it. So all those energies need to be included in an overall look. Uh, some would call it true cost accounting if we're into the money side of things. It basically includes everything it takes to run the process. Here we have a life cycle of the manufacturing process of a solar cell, all the way from the mining, the transportation, melting it in the electric arc furnace, converting it into a, a cell, putting the panel together, and ending up with a panel. That panel then, at the end of its life, gets recycled back, and the process starts all over again. What's also shown in here are the inputs of electricity. And where that electricity is generated has a big impact on the amount of CO2 per kilowatt hour of the solar cell, which is why we see the big variation. You might be thinking, sure, it takes energy to make a solar cell, but do we get more electricity out of it than we put into it? And the answer is yes, we do. The question is, how much CO2 do we generate making the solar cell and comparing that to other technologies? Now, here is where the difficulty lies and why we have such a variation, because the electricity used to make the solar cell comes from various sources, depending on where it's made and who's making it. The NREL, or the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, was put together by the United States government to help accelerate the transition to renewable energy. Now here, they put a chart together comparing different technologies in terms of grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. What this chart does is it allows us to compare different technologies. I can compare wind to solar to hydro to gas to coal, etc. A couple things about this chart that need to be considered when we're using it to analyze different technologies. Number one, in the solar area, the electricity used for the process, where it comes from, is not normalized. It's specifically stated as not being part of the analysis. So if I'm using coal to generate the electricity for this process, I'm going to end up with a lot more greenhouse gases than if I'm using some other form such as hydro. Second, one of the big things we need to consider is with solar and wind, the storage of the electricity is a major component that we have to consider. The Energy Information Agency, or the EIA of the U.S. government, is predicting that by 2050 we will have half of our power coming from solar and wind, which means we have to store that power somewhere, or we have to have a major amount of backup power with gas and coal. Where is that power going to be stored? It would have to be batteries. We know that making batteries is very energy intensive, and if you go look at my video on electric cars, we go into detail about how batteries are 
made and what it takes to make them and all the environmental impacts. Just like batteries used anywhere else, batteries used for power generation backup are going to have to be replaced on a regular basis. And as we know from all our other processes, in order to recycle a battery, we typically have to add a lot of energy, if not as much as we originally did making the battery, sometimes more to get rid of impurity. Here's a funny story. In Kansas, they're building a new battery plant. That battery plant will be powered by a coal plant, and they had to extend the life of this coal plant in order to generate enough power for this battery plant to have enough power to make batteries. It's kind of ironic. When I take a true life cycle of the entire process for the solar cell and the battery backup and all the power needed and all the, the increase in infrastructure required for that to happen, and I compare that to a natural gas power plant or a nuclear power plant that utilizes mostly what we already have in place, then the natural gas and the nuclear start looking considerably better than the solar. And there's no reason why we should not be focusing our efforts in that area. And this is my point for doing this video, is we are heading down the wrong path, focusing on solar and wind as our major source of electricity. We should be focusing on natural gas with carbon capture and nuclear as our major source of electricity. We could end up down the road with much lower carbon emissions and a much cheaper form of energy. The reason I think we should be focusing on gas and nuclear is that we can utilize most of our existing infrastructure to do this. Even with carbon capture, we can add that as a add-on to a lot of the plants that we already have. So going back to our NREL chart comparing different technologies, as we've seen, we only included the solar cell or the windmill. What was not included was the battery backup for that or some other form of energy storage. That would be a huge increase in the amount of energy needed. And so that would increase the CO2 gas per kilowatt hour for that form of technology. Now, that is not the case with gas, and it's not the case with nuclear. We don't need that battery backup, which is very important. So when we're comparing these technologies, we need to include all the energy required. Now, nuclear comes with its own set of issues, uh, just like anything I was not a big proponent of nuclear way back in the day, but uh, looking at the energy landscape we have today, I think nuclear is actually a pretty good alternative, and I'm going to do several videos on nuclear, and we'll talk about its history and sort of why it got to where it is, why it's expensive, uh, why government has so much oversight over it, and what are the issues. We'll talk about that in a completely different video, but just say just to say that I think nuclear is someplace we should really be putting a lot of effort, and we need that effort put in there to counteract some of this, 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 this love affair we have with solar and wind. And I, I don't dislike them, but I don't see them as the answer to our energy woes. Also, we need to push back on our government that forcing us into these technologies that don't make sense. We need to look at this from a holistic viewpoint the entire life cycle of whatever technology we use and go from there. We don't want to have our green glasses on and say we need to pursue these things just because they're different than what we're doing now. I think a lot of us have had this romantic notion that solar was going to be the answer, that we would have, we've got this unlimited supply of sun and we have unlimited source of energy. We simply need to put panels on every roof and put some batteries in different places and we would have all the energy we need. However, our modern society doesn't operate that way. When we look at it on a global or grand scale with enough power to actually supply all of our industry and all our manufacturing, the picture is very different than our romantic view of it. It's a very low density power source, meaning it takes a lot of square footage per kilowatt hour to make work. What we need is an energy source with a higher power density. Wind and solar are going to produce a lot of waste. We're going to constantly be having to change out panels. We're going to be changing out wind turbine blades. We're going to be changing out batteries. We're going to have to recycle them and use all that energy to do that. If we have an energy source with a higher power density and less waste, we will end up 
having much less impact on the earth, and it will be much better for us as humans. It's not too far along in the energy transition to make a course change and simply use things that make more sense. Let's be honest about the impacts of some of these quote unquote renewable energy sources. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any comments or questions, leave them in the comments section and I will try to get to them as soon as I can. My other goal is that you walk away from this video with a little more knowledge, better informed than when, when you started to watch the video. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Check out my channel for a deeper dive into the topics of energy and climate change.